that's silent. Now I'm worried. <laughs> okay. Welcome, everyone. So it's our first, first meetup up this year. We'll hope to organize them regularly. So every, uh, every two months? Every second month. Every other month. There should be a GitHub meetup. Um, yeah, I don't have to introduce, introduce Konstantin, Mr. Evazet. Uh, he's going to introduce us to GitHub free. Um, so I'll just let's get started. Let's yep. get started. Sure. Everybody can hear me. A bit louder. A bit louder <coughs> on my voice. Okay. So somewhere approximately four years ago, I I was looking into like new cool tools that I can use for development or for testing, and uh, one of those tools that I got into was Cucumber. And I got really, really, really into this stuff. It's like, goddamn, you can write functional tests that business can read, right? It's just like functional tests that fancy, that are fancy and can convince business people to go with testing. So awesome. Oh my god, how, how, how much I was wrong. <laughs> and then, like, the first thing I tried to do, just because I don't like to reinvent bicycles, I tried to bring Cucumber to Ruby, to, to PHP community, I tried to, to make it work, and it didn't quite work, because the languages are so different. And then somewhere around this time, I started to think about, like, building the tool set in PHP that does things like Cucumber does, exactly the same thing, but in PHP. And I was doing this with wrong intentions. I was doing like it as a functional testing framework, which is, it isn't. It is a communication tool. And, uh, but over the time, over, over the time developing the tool, tool started to teach me something. And the practices, the blog posts, the, the books around the, the internet around the world, started to open my eyes on like on the different world where you can develop software by caring about the value you're delivering. And that, that changed me, that changed my career. And I think there is a huge part of it that lies in the tool. And I'm happy today to kind of to show you the future of this tool and to show you where we're going with it. But first, let's look at all of those years behind us and what we achieved. And I think like one of the best metrics is usage metrics, right? how the tool is actually used in the community. So, if you guys know what it is, it's packages. So it is PHP package repository. It's single source if you want to download something and manage your dependencies in the PHP project. And there is overall 467, 68 thousands installations since version 2.2. And version 2.2 was released at the end of 2011. That's a pretty big number. And it means like Cucum Cucumber or Behat, they are used a lot. And it means it does bring something to the project. It does change the projects. And uh, not only it's, it, it does those things, it, it does bring the benefits to the commercial projects. It does bring the benefits to the open source project. And we know that because we see the projects like Silius. So Silius is e-commerce PHP platform, open source platform, that is built through BDD. So it is built using tools like BHAT or PHP spec. It has a huge code base, and it's built from scratch using behavior-driven development approaches and using BHAT. And there are a couple of quotes from the guys that developed this. Uh, Something along the lines, thanks for keeping our sanity <laughs> during development of the project. And it's surprising how, how much it helps during development of this e-commerce project because there is another project like Akineo, and this is product information management tool, also open source, and it's also built through BDD, through BHAT. And one of, the guy, one of the core developers in the company and in this project are one of my past colleagues in the previous company from KMP Labs. And he's like, it's so, it's so cool that he continues to do the stuff that we were doing together when we were in KMP Labs, even in a different company. There is something that, like, that touches your ability to see the projects from this point on when you start using those tools. 
And there is also projects like Open Scholar, which is Drupal-based project for building your, well, basically it's a side, open source site builder for academic <coughs> institutions. It helps you to build a site if you're an academic institution. Also driven through Behat. Well, they don't use Behat properly. It's not for ability. They use it for testing. But still, I believe they, there is opportunity for them to, to learn, to understand BDD the same way as I did when I started from the wrong foot. And there is a huge success on Drupal.org. Like, if somebody doesn't know, one year ago there was a huge migration from, of Drupal to Git and also to the new code base. And they were in Russia trying to ensure that the code base stays in the good quality and, they, uh, and that the project is, is also working after they do this migration. And there is a huge PDE proponent, Melissa Anderson, that were leading this project forward. And they did huge test suite using BHAT and using BDD. They moved the project forward. And I think one of the big <coughs> show, shows that <coughs> those practices work is the fact that Melissa, after this project, moved away from Drupal, from Drupal project, from Drupal org. And she started her own <coughs> career as a BDD practice manager or BDD trainer. She believes in those practices so well. They worked so good for her that she's like, that's her career right now. That's what she's interested in. <coughs> and obviously that's me in Envika. That's the company I joined almost a year ago. And this is a company where I have a huge opportunities to change not only, not only 80 developers that work for us or even more, but also all the clients that we touch, all the, all the projects that we do, improve every single bit of code that we're writing or we're involved in writing. That's a huge thing for us. And by the way, Envika is the company that sponsors this meetup today, and also the company that created a bunch of really great Behat 3 t-shirts. So <laughs> if you want to get one, you, you should go to Isabel right there and fill in the enquête to, to get a possibility of getting one. Shameless plug. <laughs> so I think if there is any outcome of all, everything that I just said, is that the BDD in PHP is big. It is huge and it's growing. And it's growing like with, with extreme paces right now. And one of the key reasons behind that, of course, is BHAT. And I think BHAT is, it kind of changed the structure of the way we develop PHP projects from the point on. It changed the way we treat requirements, it changed the way we, we move the project forward and we plan the projects forward. But as any, any hero in this world, as any good project, it has its own arch nemesis, right? It has a bunch of problems that cripple around and prevent us from moving forward. So there is three of them, actually, that <coughs> prevented me from just growing we had two code base going forward. And one of them is this. So this is like issue opened on the GitHub about parallel test execution. So we have those like huge test suites that when they grow, they start taking quite some time to, to run. And you want at some point to start paralleling them. And uh, you would imagine that there is a plenty of guys that are interested in solving this problem. <coughs> a lot of them. It is a huge, huge problem. And parallel execution is one of the keystones on which the hat tree was built. It doesn't have it just yet, but there is a code. <laughs> there is a code inside that makes it possible. And we had three one will have parallel execution just because of that. The second thing is there is 100,000 results to the hard context classes too big. <laughs> Obviously, it's an like aggregation, it's Google stuff. But the thing is, with the way Behat structures the context, with the way Behat structures your step definitions, they get out of control really, really quick. And that's a common problem for, for all the projects we have. 
some solutions like page objects, we have some solutions like service factories inside our domain layer. But it is overall a huge problem of handling our context classes. Because in comparison with Cucumber Ruby, for example, we have one class, PHP class, that handles all the definitions inside. And that's why we introduced all the subcontext thingies to handle the situation. But I'm not entirely sure, convinced that we handled the situation in the proper way, or we created more mess with that. So growing context is a big problem. And then there is this. So all the time when I'm going to the trainings or I'm going to the conferences, this is pretty much what I'm saying. Context class is your domain dictionary for a specific actor. So what I'm saying is you want to treat different actors in your system and you want, if there is a different dictionary that they use, if there is a different sentences they use to describe their part of the domain, you don't want to tailor them all to, to one uh, core domain. You want to tailor them differently. If people dif talk in a different language, you want to tailor them differently. And the key there is, depending on the actor, depending on the beneficiary of the feature, you could have different people talking about the same thing, but meaning the different things. So for administrator, the home page could be something completely different from the user. So there is this thing that we were preaching since the very beginning when we were going to the trainings. But then there is this thing. There is only one context class for all your features. And I fear there is there is there is slight problem somewhere there. I fear that we're kind of there is a dissonance in between the things that we are saying and the things that tool allows us to do. And actor-based definitions is the third part of this like huge problem that we're trying to solve. And the thing is. Those, all, all of those three problems have one solution. And the solution is, you should be able to test features against different contexts. Now, there is, I know there is, in the, in the Cucumber community, there is a movement of like having different contexts or step definitions for each feature. That's like, that's, that's going too far. What you want to do is you want to, to treat differently actors or users that naturally are different. You want to have this ability. And in case of parallel execution, you want also be, to be able to split the entire feature set across different contexts so you can run them in the parallel. But there is a problem, and it's version 2 architecture. And in version 2, if, if you're familiar with it, the way Behat works is you have overall, when you run Behat, it runs one single profile. Profile is a set of configuration for your test execution. And each profile would have one, two, three sets of features, right? So each profile could have different features, but you can run only one profile per execution. And each profile have one context class plus subcontexts. Which means if you're trying to represent it in the graphical form, you have a context class which holds all your definitions, transformations, and hooks, and you have BHAT. And whenever you run the entire su suite, it talks constantly with one single context class. So there is no way to parallelize this stuff. There is no way to place uh, split in between, because they are so bound together. You can't do anything about that. And that's pretty much those three problems, and this architectural issue is the reason behind BHAT 3. And that's the reason why the high 3 also doesn't have back backward compatibility. Now, it is built on the same principles. It, is, it follows the same ideas. It still has the context classes. It still has the step definitions. It, has, it still uses sometimes regexps. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. But it is basically a new framework. And the reason behind this is exactly this one. So, Bihat 3. By the way, that's a new logo of Bihat. I think it represents the idea of what it does much, much better. There is a scrum thing scrolled in. So in Bihat 3, you still have a profile. But lower the profile, there is a new thing that lives. It's called Switch. And you have, 
you could have one suite or two suites inside one single profile. And suite is a collection of features and their test configuration for those features, which means you could have things like that. You could have one profile assigned to two suites, and suite number one could have like feature one, feature two, and the context class, which tests those features. And then you could have suite two that have feature three and feature four, which are tested against different context class. So you could have different actors described through different definitions. Some of the step definitions could still be inherited, right? Because it's still OP, it's still class. You can inherit class from the other classes or use composition there. But the idea is you can use different context classes for different features. But it's not per feature basis, it's per suite. And another cool part is there is slight change from the previous slide here. <laughs> if you see, there is a feature 1, 2, and 3, 4. But what Switch also allows you to do is to test same features against different contexts. So it sounds like a crazy idea, but there is an interesting part there. I know Uncle Bob like loves to bash approach where you use like Cucumber with Capybara to test your applications through the web interface. But recently he proposed like alternative, and the alternative says <coughs> you want to test your entire application, or most of it, through the code base. You don't want to touch the web interface, which is fragile. And then you want to test only a small, small fraction of it through the web interface. And if you think about this, this, this suite structure actually allows it. So you could have a set of features, business features, that describe functionality on your website. And you could test most of them through basic PHP calls, like integration tests. And then you will choose a small fraction of them, like 10, 5%, to actually run them, the same features, through the web interface. Or you can run the same features through different web interfaces. One through Selenium and Firefox, one through Selenium and Chrome. So there's immense amount of possibilities there. And the way you configure it now in Bihat YAML, Bihat YAML is a single configuration file for Bihat. So you define the profile, which is called the default. And then you define the list of suites. In this case, it's first and second. And then under each suite, you define the pass. So basically, where to find your features. And then you define a list of contexts, like first context and second context. So what we're saying here, there is a feature called, there is a suite called first, which searches all features inside features first folder and runs all of them against first context class. And there is a suite second, which searches all the features in the features second folder and runs them against second context, right? It's a pretty simple idea, but yeah, it doesn't stop there. It, it takes it even further and it says, you don't even need to specify the passes. You don't need to store your features in the different folders. What you can do is you can run same features for two different suites, but use filters. It's a classical Gherkin filter, so you can use tags or names. And Behat 3 actually adds new filter, which is role filter. Basically what it does, it parses your narrative and through regexps understands your actor from the narrative. And if your narrative says, as a little kid, then this feature will be run again against little kid suite and against little kid context. But if your feature actually says, as a big brother, then it will be run against second suite and the different context. <coughs> so just to give it a little bit perspective. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> All right. So does everybody see that? All right. So I'm going to the suites folder and let's see what we have here. So we have here features, two features, user sees homepage and admin sees homepage. So let's look at user sees homepage. 
Feature user sees a homepage. In order to find out why this website is so useful for me, as a user, actor as a user, I need to see its benefits and descriptions on the homepage. And we have scenario with two steps. When I go to the homepage, then I should see a list of benefits. And then we have a separate feature which says admin sees a homepage. In order to moderate website as an admin, role as an admin, I need to see site administration tools when I logged in. So different steps, given that I'm logged in, but still when I go to the homepage, so we assume that administ for administrator the homepage is different, <coughs> then I should see the website admin panel. And then what we have? We have the add.yaml configuration file in which we say there is two suites, user and <coughs> admin suite. And user suite uses user context, but admin suite uses admin context. And they filter based on the role. So now, if we run bhat dash dash init, which initializes the suite and initializes, creates the context classes for you, bhat actually knows that you have two suites with two different contexts and it generates two context classes for you. Now if you run bhat again, not only that, it runs two features, but it understands that those two features have two different sets of step definitions that it needs to generate. So user context has two step definitions that it needs to have, and admin context have, needs three step definitions. <laughs> and if we run append snippets, which basically appends those snippets into the context classes for, for us, they go into appropriate contexts. So now if we run bhat again, let me, so now if we run bhat again, we see the same step when I go to the home page. In, in the case of first feature executes again user context, I go to the home page step definition. But in the case of second feature, the same step when I go to the home page will execute again admin context, I go to the, to the home page. And again, you could use inheritance, so you could say, actually, this is the same step, and you can inherit them from the same context, parent context class, which will define this same step. And that's pretty much what suites do. Pretty cool, eh? <laughs> but now that's not all. So we also have those context classes. And as I said, the context classes still, even though we're, we're now have ability to split them based on the actor, or based, based on the beneficiary, it is still a lot of definitions to handle there. And here's the interesting thing. I said that for each suite, you have a context class. I lied a bit, because you could actually have context classes for each suite. So you don't have subcontexts anymore. But in each suite, you could have multiple independent context classes working around them. So you can split your f definitions across different classes naturally. And the way it looks, if you could see uh, the context that we used before, it is an array. And it's a, you define the class names there. And you just put the comma and you put as many classes as you want there. But we don't stop there because basically, if you remember in BHA2, there was this thing of context parameters. So it's one single array of parameters that we always pass to the context constructor. And it, this was a universal way to pass environment variables or environment configurations from your bhat yaml file to your context class. But now, as we have more than one context, it doesn't make a lot of sense anymore. So what we have instead is we have context parameters defined in line with the context. So you could have multiple context classes, and they all have, could have different parameters. So for example, your base URL thingy that you use most of the time with mean context probably will go in the more natural way from this point on. And let me show you a demo again. So here's our context. 
So what we have here is essentially the same feature files, but if we look into, your, into our user context, the definitions are already generated, but here we have two <coughs> instance variables, like username and base URL, and both of them have like default values. So username is Mike, and base URL is localhost. So what we do in the constructor, we assign them to instance variables, and then in the I go to the home page, we just print them to the screen. So if we run behind now, we'll see something like this. So this is our when I go to the home page step, and this is our user and URL printed with localhost. Now if we want to change it, we go to behat.yaml, and we change this user context to be configurable. So we say user context is an array of configuration, and the first parameter will be, it's a name, so let's say John, and the second parameter will be HTTP behat org. So if we run behat again, now it uses different parameters. So different parameters were passed to the constructor. But even more than that, you could say, if I have defaults, do I always need to pass them in the, in the <coughs> order? And you can actually use names of the variables. And we had will pass them accordingly. So you can say base URL, and base URL will go first. And for behad, it doesn't matter. It will match the arguments of the constructor based on the name. OK. So now the hard bit. And that's, that's the most, I think that's the most exciting feature for the user base. Definitions matching. So if you think about Behat and definitions matching, or if you ask some newcomers into Behat, or maybe even to Cucumber, what's the hardest thing you think to get your head around in, in, in the web base? And they probably will answer something along the lines of this. Right? It's just like, we created this regex matching to the step definitions. And we're kind of, we get away was that just because we, we added this snippet generator. So in most cases, people don't need to touch this. But when they do, this is where we get a lot of like feedback or responses to, to on, on mailing lists where people just don't know what to do or don't know what, what's wrong. Hey, my reg regex doesn't match. <coughs> so as with anything I do in Bihar, I just look into different communities and look into Ruby. And there is a solution in the Ruby. <laughs> and the solution is Turnip. So basically, Turnip is a Gherkin extension for RSpec. It basically recreates Cucumber, but on top of the RSpec. And in addition to do, doing this bold move, they, they made a couple of changes in the way they do matching for, for the Gherkin. One of those is they introduced replacement for the Gherkin, for, for regex, sorry, and it's placeholders. So basically they use strings with a special placeholders format, which is hopefully easier to understand. And it basically covers all the basic cases, and it does this much in the much easier way than the, than the regex do. So as with anything we do in PHP, we just copied it. <laughs> So now, now you can do something like this in the tree. So you can say, given there is a monster called column name. And the cool part about this step definition is that it will match to the given there is a monster called Jake. And it will actually pass Jake as an argument to, to your method. But it also will match to the given there is a monster called Jake with single quotes. Or it will also match to, given there is a monster called Jake without quotes. Or it will even match to, given there is a monster called 23, because it's a number. So it doesn't matter what it is there. It will logically remove the double quotes. It will logically look at your variable there. And it's just like it does what you logically expect it to do in the most cases. And it goes even further where. Basically, what those, this syntax does, it adds right. optional s at the end, and it, it does is or r in the definition, which basically means this definition will match to given there is one monster. 
It will also match given there are five monsters. And it will even match to given there are no monsters. And you can transform no with transformations into the zero later on. So that's pretty cool, I think. <laughs> And the crazy thing, turnip is a new default now. So whenever you run bhat 3, out of the box it generates turnip for you, so you don't need to worry about regex anymore. Even cooler part is that both turnip and regex are still supported, and you can even have both in the same context class. So it doesn't matter, you could have one of, some of the step definitions where, which are really, really hard, to write them in the regexps, and Behat will still understand you. Or by default, you can use turnips, and Behat will still understand you. And there is another thing regarding to snip generation. There is a problem with Behat 2 where it basically tries to guess where it needs to put the snippets when you use append snippets, and it creates some problems from time to time. There is one problem where you install mink extension, which provides default context, and you don't have your own context class. What happens when you run behat append snippets, it actually tries to, it doesn't try, it actually does, append snippets to the main context. And then you run it again, and you have those pending snippets where, which come out of nowhere, and you don't know what to do with it. So behat 3 changes this, and it basically says you explicitly need to define which context expects, expects snippets, and you do this by implementing interface. So behat will add or generate snippets only for the context classes that implement this interface. And there is another interface that you can implement, which tells behat not only generate, generate snippets for me, or append snippets to me, generate regex snippets instead of turnip, if you're into this kind of stuff. <laughs> okay, let me show you then. So, if we're on behind again, here, <coughs> here's the cool part. So, that's the same two features that we used before, but if we look closely, admin context, here's the step definitions for it. So, it's a turnip step definitions. There is no brackets for their gasps. It's pretty simple, it's just a string. But if we look at the user context, those are actually regexps. And the way it works is when we go to the actual context classes, our admin context implements snippet accepting context interface. And our user context implements custom snippet accepting interface which forces it to add this method, which tells exactly what type of the regex, what, what type of the pattern it expects. And what happens if we remove this and implement context interface instead? Mm. Sorry. Okay. So if we run it again, this is what happens. So it generates, it successfully generates the, cont uh, the step definitions for the user context, but it says, Snippets for the following steps in the admin suite were not generated. Check your configuration. And it tells you that it wasn't been able to generate step definitions for those for the suite because it doesn't know where to generate them. So no more like silent failures like I can generate steps but I wouldn't tell you why. <coughs> so the next stop, hooks. Hooks are really interesting beasts. So, in Behat 2, hooks were, those were like basically functions that you can call before or after your tests, but they weren't being part of the tests. So whenever your hooks were throwing an exception, you were getting something like this and Behat suite were dying. So basically like the whole test was stopping. So the idea was like you need to avoid throwing exceptions or you know, like having failures in your hooks. And the reason why it was this way is because hooks were after, like always were afterthought rather than anything. They were never be part they were never been a part of the test run. And in Bihat 3, let me just show you what happens. So the same 
suite that will blow up in BHAT 2, if we run it in BHAT 3, we'll get something like this. So this is what happens. We have before scenario hook, which tells us like, it's almost like they're assigned to this guy, and it is executed from this context, from this context, and that's the exception that it throws. And just because of this exception, this scenario, this scenario gets skipped, and you got a failure at the end. So it actually return, returns one. So it tells you that the test suite doesn't work, but all the consequent scenarios will still run. Now, if it's like if it's before step hook it will actually cause consequent steps to fail. So it works the way you expect it to work, and it also gives you the needed feedback that you expect it to give to you. So if, for example, this before scenario, if we change it to... If we change it to before step... Step. And we try to run it again. You see it moved down, and now we see exactly where it's thrown. So we know the, the actual place where the hook failed, and we, don't, we know the reason. But now the scenario also failed because basically we can't execute the scenario. So it's just like it failed in the middle of scenario rather than not being able to execute at all. So hooks are now first class citizens, and they basically are part of your tests. And you now could have exceptions in your hooks, and the hat will tell you where this exception happens, why, and will gently skip the next scenario or next step. Now formatters. Formatters were completely rewritten in the hat 3, and the reason why is because there were a couple of problems with formatters in 2. They were outputting some things in the really cryptic way. So for example, the outlines. And we had two, this would be just a failure with all the green steps or with all the red steps. We had three actually tells you where it fails. It tells you that it fails in the step that has seven inside, so the last step. This is something that I know Cucumber does for a long time, but for we had it's quite a new thing. <laughs> yeah. So it actually colors the, the cell that has a token that throws an exception. And it goes even further, if you actually expand your outline tables, not only it will print them as the usual step definitions, with usual places, with usual exceptions, it will actually print them as they progress. So in BH2, it was actually printing like three steps at a time. In VR3, it will print each step when it happens. So you get immediate feedback on your step definitions. If you have more than five steps, which most likely you shouldn't, you will have like clear feedback as they go. And there is other 1,000s, other small improvements that go through the formatters. And pretty much what I try to achieve with formatters is we try to make it them, to make them as clear as possible and give you as much context as possible so you don't need to spend time you know, like under, trying to understand what we have tries to tell you. you know, where this exception comes from, where does this hook fails. Formatters try to communicate back all this information. There is another cool feature in we have 3 which is output buffering. So if some of you use we had 2 extensively, you know that in base behat context class, which you almost likely extended at some point, there was this method called, method called print debug. What print debug was doing, it was printing the output or string that you provide in the nice form inside the output. So it was just outputting your information in the nice form. And you needed to remember this step. And more than that, it was, it was working, but it was printing this, the the, the echoing the information that you provided before the step definition or the step information actually printed. So it was printing the echo and then it was printing the step, which was cryptic at some point. You know, 
uh, you, you can understand what it was doing and why it was doing that, but it was hard to see what, where the things failed. So let me show you how things are working in VR3 now. So if we go to our buffering, so now if we're on VHAT, we have one exception. <laughs> and if we go into the, like, and let's say we want to debug this exception. And the way we do this now, we go here and we say, do something before and var dump or just echo. Uh, okay. Now if we run behind again, Here's the output. So it catch, catches the output, bu output, buffers it, and actually prints it in the place where you expect it to print. Not before the step, inside the step, but with the right alignment from the left, so you understand that it's related to the step definition. And it actually works the same way if you do this with hooks. So if your hook actually outputs any, any text, you try to run the hat. Again, you have the output. And in this case, the hook is highlighted as green because it doesn't produce any exceptions. So it actually passes, but you produce output out of it. So this is a useful way for you to generate some information regarding your feature context tests. So like reload the database or something else just to bring you some more context to the stuff you're doing. OK. So then, there is this thing where error handling. So, who knows about dash v in the hat? <coughs> so, what dash v does, I will make your day probably now. So what the dash v does, it, it tells the hat to work in the verbose mode. So basically, whenever you have exception, it prints information about this exception rather than just message of it under the step. So in case when you were using mink with behats, that's what it was doing. So it was actually printing like information about the current page, response code, and the current driver that mink was using, plus the text of the page or the context of the page. The problem with this approach was, this is really, really useful information. But if in addition to this useful information somewhere you have step that just throws an exception, you also will have this, which is a stack stru trace, which is useful sometimes, but if you just want this, it's not that useful. So behind 3 introduces three levels of verbose. <laughs> so dash v will just print, mean, just print this stuff and messages for, ex for usual exceptions. Dash W will actually show you stack traces. So you will see stack traces only when you need them, but not before. So verbose is actually verbose now, not, not stack traces. <laughs> is it very verbose? Hmm? Is VB very verbose? Yeah. <laughs> and there is very, very verbose, the certain uh. version. Which I don't, I don't know what we will use it for, but we'll find something. <laughs> <laughs> so, those are like a couple of really big features. There is a lot of small features in VHAT3. But I think the, the biggest thing around this is, I hope you are as impressed as I am <laughs> <laughs> by, by the collaboration and the community that like, were ma managed to produce this kind of biz. But I think it all comes down to how it was possible and how it was possible to produce some complex code base around it. And I think one of the key parts were Travis, right? Travis were constantly running. We had around against three different versions of PHP, making sure that we don't break anything there. And against four different versions of Symfony to make sure that we're not breaking there. Because Bihat actually uses extensively uh, Symfony components, which is like set of components which we use to, to develop the tool. And we actually run against three different versions of PHP, four different versions of those components, and we know for sure that things work. 
And even more than that, since we had three, we started to use Scrutinizer, which is code quality tool. It ensures that not only we, we have a working code base, we have a high quality code base. Uh, and if you put like in perspective, we had three development in one picture, this is how it looks. So we started from something around nine, and then over like last months, we grown to almost 10, which is 985. So it is really, really high quality. And it's just like, it's not, it's not just gimmick, it actually pinpoints important problems in the code base, important issues. What this rating actually means, it means that whenever somebody will find a bug, and we'll definitely find some small bugs, it will be extremely easy to find it and fix it. And we wouldn't touch like all the parts of the system when we're doing so. Yeah. So, big part of it, while, while we were developing the Hub 3, uh, it became really quickly apparent that most of the things we're doing are not related to the tool itself, to the hat itself, or not related to Gherkin-based testing. Most of the things we were doing, like console handling, error handling, output producing, hooks, most of those, those things were related not for be, to be had itself, but to general testing tools. And as a consequence of this process, we got a new framework, which currently lives in Bihad, but it will move away starting from Bihad 3.1, and it's a test work. Basically, it's a framework to create your own testing frameworks. It is a tool that makes it really easy to build your own tools if you're not happy with Bihad or PHP spec and you want, you're just into this kind of stuff. What? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it just, it was, it wasn't, it never was a goal. It was a natural consequence of the code pass that we chose. And let me show you the last demo of like what, what it means to be so decoupled as part of the test work. So here's the last demo, and I want to show it against the real like source code version of Bihat, which just like lives in the uh, under the Git repository. So let me show Bihat in Bihat. Okay, so let me run it. So as you can as you can see, there is a plenty of things happening here. Let me make it a little bit smaller. So there's a plenty of things happening here. So there is a step that produces in three outputs. There is a failing before scenario hook. There is an indefinite step which generates like snippets. So and keep an eye on this guy. So this guy produces like in three. And the reason why it produces in three is because in the feature context, there is a transformer which transforms like string numbers into the integers. <coughs> now let's run it again. Let me see, show you some really interesting thing. So, so this is like the main application factory class of Bihat. So this, this is the class that basically mm -hmm. combines all the different parts of, or pack, sub packages of Bihat and makes Bihat what Bihat is. So if you, if you take a closer look, there is these things like Gherkin extension, context extension, definition extension, hook extension. So those guys basically provide separate parts of what the hat is. And if we turn off some of them, like transformation extension, right? And we run the hat again, it still runs, but mm. it is string now because transformations don't work. And then we can say, you know, Snippets um, don't want them either. And take a look. There is like eight megabytes of memory used. Run again. Oh no, seven. But there is no snippets anymore. Let's also turn off the hooks. <laughs> right? No hooks. It runs, but step is still indefinite. Uh, I don't know. Let's go crazier. Let's turn off context <laughs> because I. Because I told you, told you that the contexts are like still integral part of Bihat. <laughs> it still runs, it just doesn't know how to test things, so they're all indefinite. 
<laughs> and just to close it, it's just like if you think that the formatters or you know, this printing thing is so important. <laughs> 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 and the thing is, it actually executes because if I return back the context, look at the green dot, it actually is red. So it doesn't produce any output, but it actually made the tests inside. So it seems like a f fancy gimmick, but what it means for you, for users, it means that not only that like, things are cleanly designed inside, it means if some of the parts of Pihad does, don't work, or, do, or even don't work the way you want them to work, you can replace them entirely. Or somebody else can replace them entirely if you want that to happen. And it also means for extension developers, there is unlimited possibilities. Pihad is just a set of extensions on top of the really, really small core. It means Pihad itself is an extension. And it means like, as Pihad, will introduce this complex structure and this com complex functionality, you can introduce more complex functionality on top of that. New features and even more crazier ideas, bringing them back. That means that the possibilities to grow behind further are incredible. You can build your own tool that will suit you best. And you don't need to follow you know, like this like classical conventions that we're dictating. So, this is pretty much like, not all, but most of the important things about BHAT3 that you need to know about. And now, as of next steps. So first of all, like a couple of days ago I released 3.0.0 RC3, and the reason why there is a word gold, it means that basically this RC3, when we have BHAT documentation and BHAT extensions, this is a release. So it's stable. It is a release. The reason why we're not releasing it is like generally available because we want to give you documentation, we want to give you extensions updated so you can use them out of the box. The next step for me is to introduce new Behat org. So there is a new design as you can see that I'm working on and there will be a huge input, huge um, the, the community will be a huge part of it we will try to bring extension developers to one single resource where they can bring documentation, information, and conversations around their extensions into one place. So they, don't, they wouldn't need to handle all those documentation generation phases, and you as users wouldn't need to search for documentation of this specific extension all across the web. It all will be in one place. We have documentation and extensions documentation. And you will be able to find extensions and check their compatibility with your with specific version of Behat you're using. And it's in the works. And also, there is four core extensions among a lot of them that we're trying to bring to Behat 3. And I don't think we will release Behat 3 until we got all of them to the, to the full compatibility layer. Because, let's face it, even though I'm kind of proposing to use Behat without the web interface. You most likely would want to use Mink together with it. And we want to make sure that if you're using Symfony or Mink or Drupal, which all have really good extensions and really good ecosystem around Behat, you will be able to use it in a really natural way, starting from the 3.0 release. And release, it's 20th April, <laughs> one month from now, in the next year. <laughs> <laughs> so one month from now, I'm planning to release the ad 3 And since, like from this moment till this date, the key for me will be to prepare and release the new version of the org with updated documentation for version 3 and the new extensions updated and supporting version 3. Um, I think this all wouldn't be possible without a couple of like personalities that I need to mention. Uh, first of all, there is Aslak, who's, who's here today. He's create, who knows who, who Aslak is, by the way? 
Shame on you. <laughs> Aslik is initial creator of Cucumber. So, thank you very much for creating Cucumber. And I think it's just like, it's the tool that changed my life. And I just hope that the same way as Cucumber changed my perception of software engineering, I hope that someday or I will be able to change it like someone else's life with, with the tools that I'm developing. Thank you very much for this. Also, there is another person who's not here today, sadly, but Christoph was a huge part of moving the heart forward. And he was basically spending sleep, sleepless nights <coughs> reviewing all the crazy pull requests I were sending for the head. And he's like, I'm almost sure when you will run the hut and you have a Windows, it will work perfectly for you. <laughs> and he's, he's the guy to, to say thanks. Because nobody, nobody from, from near, near my desk actually uses Windows. <laughs> this guy actually does. He's the, he's the guy that made all of this possible. Like he's the guy that were reviewing all, all the crazy changes that I was doing. He's the guy that was review, constantly reviewing three different iterations of architecture. And that's quite a lot of work, if you can imagine. And it's like he's one of the biggest guys to say thank you for the hat 3 because it wouldn't be possible without that. <laughs> also in Vika, my company, um, the practice that I got in the last year, I wouldn't be able to grow my expertise to the same level and understand where the tool should go. And people around me that were constantly giving me advices and helping me to understand where the tool should, should go forward and just like creating constant challenges and issues around. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what keeps tool, tools moving forward. It's just a constant motivation in improving. And of course you guys, so the art communities, you're amazing and you're like, like 80 people today. That's, that's incredible. I mean, just having this group today and just having you all here interested in the tool that I wrote, I, I would never imagine this happening in my life. And it's pretty cool. And I think one of the biggest attributes of, of Bihat community is I don't have much time, sadly, to, to answer like basic questions on the, on the Google group. But every time I'm going there and I'm reading some like basic comment, guy doesn't know what to do. Like in a couple of minutes, there's somebody that answers immediately. And it doesn't matter how basic the question is or how, like, how stupid the question is. There is always somebody who wants to help, who drives community forward. And it's just like, it wouldn't be possible without you. It's just like we would have constant struggle because of me changing break and breaking things all around. Thank you very much. So now questions don't. So if you think you have really good question that everybody should listen and just like act, like punish me for breaking backwards compatibility, right? Just like ask me really hard questions so everybody will listen to them. Yeah. Ask oh. um, Well, I don't have a question. I just wanted to thank you. Uh, I think it's really great to see. Um, I'll be great on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's really inspiring to see that uh, what you've done with it. Um, um, you know, Cucumber is, Cucumber and B Hat and BD, all these things, they are, we picked up by developers and then testers, and, and now there's a movement to try and, and, and get business analysts and the non technical people, you know, the, the people with the requirements to get involved in this way of working. And, and it's, it's just so great to see uh, Constantine, who's, who's somebody who understands the core values of of this philosophy uh, being behind such a fantastic tool. I'm actually a little bit scared because the features that you put in your hat and also the internal design that you showed us um, leaves a lot to be desired um, <laughs> for, for, for the original implementation you know, um, because we, we certainly have a lot of work to do both, both in terms of improving the tool and uh, uh, I think we have a good community. We have 5 million downloads. but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What did you mean uh, by
by uh, breaking the backwards compass with this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just imagine your 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 like worst nightmare <laughs> in case of backwards compatibility. That's it. Um, so basically, the the class names, the interface names, those things changed, but those things are still in place. So you still have your feature context class, right? Uh, you don't have some of them. So you don't have like the Two things that went away, definitely, are subcontexts, because we don't need them anymore, and the chain steps. But chain steps will pretty much come back in form of like third-party extension. Uh, <laughs> other than that, it's just I will def I will definitely prepare the document, you know, like how to upgrade. I wouldn't say there is. Like there is not much thinking involved in upgrading. There's just like a lot of small changes here and there. It's almost like it's almost like replace, you know, like find and replace everywhere. So you're gonna automate it. You're gonna automate it. You're gonna automate it. You're gonna automate it. Okay. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Is the page objects design plan still going to work, or do we have to go back to having uh, assertions and X parts of the same proposition in the classical? So, page objects, there is like. I always <coughs> like the pattern. The page object extension that we had, I would say, was had much to be desired. And my biggest goal, I think. And we talked with we talked with Jakob. Jakob is a developer of page objects extension. By the way, he's we're trying to, to think over bringing page objects extension into Mink extension as a core part of it. So there definitely will be a huge impact on page page, page object extensions. I was always believing in in the pattern itself, and like since recently I tried it on a couple of actual big commercial projects, it makes a huge difference. So we definitely will have page objects extensions. Uh, either it will be part of the Mink extension, hopefully, or as a separate extension, they are coming. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Any more? You got yes. a full park when 3.1 now. <laughs> 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 and then the pass will be helpful. 3.1. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this this whole fancy stuff that I showed with turning it off extensions hopefully means that introducing new things and moving behind forward wouldn't be as painful as moving from 2, 2 x to 3 o. So I wouldn't say years as, as it was. It, it's months. So from, from, from 3 o and to forward, we're planning to move really, really quick. There is a plenty of features that I want to introduce. There is like, parallel execution is one of them. And uh, basically, if you think about this, just the fact that we have multiple suites is, is a big enabler for the parallel run. So there's like, I'm looking at the code, the, the code base that I showed you with this disabling extensions. And there's a clear points where I can introduce it. It's just it needs to be doing, and I I just wanted to give you 3.0 before you know like waiting even longer for this stuff. So it's 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 close. It is soon. I wouldn't tell any dates though. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question about parallel execution. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's something that you can't do in well in, in Cucumber JVM, which is Cucumber for the JVM uh, Java. Groovy, Scala, all of these mm -hmm. things. Um, it's the same situation. It's not natively supported, but people have had all these plugins and, and there's some patches. Um, but the thing that I don't quite understand myself is how people, like, let's say that in, in, in the, you know, let's say you have parallel execution mm -hmm. and the system that you are running your test against is maybe a web app. Yeah. That, maybe perhaps have a database yeah. um, and the, your scenarios are going to write stuff to the database and you know even if you have a perfectly 
running, you know, parallel test runners, yeah, yeah. they are still going to stomp all over each other's data. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? So, <laughs> there are cases like we have application that worked on, which is which works with third-party integration, and it's pretty much read-only. For those cases like parallel that you're talking about, will work. Where you just like where you have just read-only data, yeah. and you can just like fetch. There is no changes there. In cases where you have changes, when you have like scenarios that basically operate on the real data, when I'm saying parallel, I more likely mean that they actually run in the parallel, but they are not on the same system. So you could have like multiple right. virtual machines right. and multiple behinds so like talking with each other. So they would go against different, you know, instances of the yeah, system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just it's more like it's not something that you can't do today. It's more like there will be one single controller instance of Bihad that will control all those instances yeah. and absorb the, the output. So it will produce single output for all those parallel executions. Right. That's the goal. I think Java is always fascinated by data consistency and data sensitivity. So I don't see how you, it's just an option. Just as in any way Java, you can talk about something like yeah, but um, I guess the problem, you, you're, just, you're just moving the problem from, from the hack and then into another layer, which yeah. is the database. But I, I, one other way to deal with it, uh, which I have to try a little bit, is, is to just use transactions, right? Mm. So let's say that you have three parallel, the three, four, five, ten threads running suites parallel yeah. against the same system. If they use database transactions, then everything will, will be isolated. There is a limitation so, with PHP because, like, okay. In PHP, when, whenever like request comes, we spawn the new process, PHP process, and we kill it afterwards. Oh, okay. So, so it's just like it's not a single process. It's not right. a single process. You can't start transaction between them. That's yeah. well, but that's technical issues. So what about dynamically generating data, working out isolation points? So if you're testing a multi-tenant application, you dynamically create a new tenant. Yes. Yeah. Free test. So this is not m like. The step definitions in the hard they pretty much do do consistent like in, in the standard PHP space. So you can do whatever is possible to do in PHP. So you can connect to the databases, you can like add records. And there are extensions for different frameworks in PHP, like C32 or Drupal extension that add those hooks back. So you can use like your own framework, like with, if, if you'd use with Ruby, where you can talk with the database directly through your model layer. And that's what you will do, basically. So you will use your model layer to, to, to add records to the database, remove records to the, from the database. And then you will run the test. But it's just like, it's something that already happens. Is it done? Yeah, yeah the data's been Yeah. Yeah. OK, any more questions? All right. Oh. Can we still use all the same browser drivers if we want to use Selenium, GoFund, JS, or are there any that don't work anymore? Actually, like, stuff works on the new Mint extension. And not only you can use the same drivers, it basically, like, introduces new abstraction in the Mint extension. You can, through Bihat YAML, define new sessions. So you can have, like, same driver working, like, alongside each other. So you can have, like, two Firefoxes talking with each other. In single BI, and, and you will need to configure it just through the HTML. So it's not only like the same functionality, it's more. Thank you. Right. Yes? Um, obviously, you've been talking about the parallel processing stuff, but one of the main pain points that we have with version 2 of BHAT is the length of time it takes to run the whole suite. Yeah. So, like, trying to minimize that in terms of kind of getting. Stuff deployed and test and everything. Like we got like applications that are running, say two hours. Um, what do you guys do to overcome that? Say, well, like, how does three help that process? Um, three doesn't help much with this process because pretty much the problem that that you have there, and which like a lot of a lot of people have, and we have, yeah, from time to time, is. It's not related to Bihad itself. Bihad is really quick, right? It's just like it parses Gherkin, runs the test, that's it. The thing that actually takes time is your connection with the database going through the web interface. That's the that's the bottlenecks. And usually like there is multiple approaches you can take. One of the like 
simplest approach is just like try to uh, to play with different drivers. So just like switching from Sahi to Selenium or from Selenium to Phantom JS can make drastical difference in performance, right? But it depends like if your test suite will work with it or not. Yeah, we're well, Selenium. Isn't it? So. Another approach which is more kind of drastical where you could look at your test suite, it's just like if you already wrote features, if you already implemented them, at this point your features, uh, by being executed, just become your functional test or integration test. So you can look at them as like, as a layer of proof for your application. And if you can move this proof layer a little bit under, so let's say refactor your functional test into unit tests, make them faster, cover the same functionality but with unit tests, for example, this is another approach you can take. So you can like, you can minimize the amount of features that you run, like specific edge cases, test them with unit tests instead, and leave the things that have direct connection with the business goals, with business values, in the, as the features, and then refactor things that don't, or have far connection into the unit tests. And the third approach is like is even more drastic, and this one is just. Take a look at your application, and it's just like it could be the case where maybe you have a lot, like just too much features. So maybe you're trying to do too much things there. Maybe you can just drop part of functionality. Obviously, it's not developer's decision to do, yeah. but you could probably you could have discussion with your client and say, you know, like you kind of want like really simple e-commerce website. I'm just making an assumption here. But you're trying to do to build the entire web portal here with all the functionality. Do you actually need this, or maybe you could actually like run Google Analytics and analyze which is used. Maybe some of the features you built and you run tests again and again and again, nobody uses, and you can just drop them together with functionality, which will not only like decrease your amo amount of time needed to test to run tests, but also like decrease your uh, amount of the code that you need to maintain over the time. So. Yeah. I definitely agree with your advice of pushing stuff mm. down to unit because <laughs> people who fall in love with, with cucumber like tools and yeah, they tend to test too much at that yeah. level and too little at the unit test level. But there's a there's a I don't know, fourth or fifth approach yeah. which doesn't exist quite yet. Um, <laughs> but I my prediction is that in, in one to two years, um, people will use this a lot more. And this is something that's called uh, failure prediction. Mm. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's an intelligent system that monitors um, the changes you make, make to the code base and test results over time and learns about the correlation using, uh, uh, what's it called? Code coverage, not code coverage. I'm thinking more about like you know uh, intelligent algorithms. Okay. Uh, actually, heuristics. Heuristics. Yeah. Heuristics. yeah. So exactly, ba uh, Bayesian um, um, Bayesian analysis and and uh, Matt and uh, Matt is one of the cucumber uh, core committers. Matt and I we were mentoring a student at um, well, what's it called Imperial College last year. He was writing a thesis about this. Mm. Um, and she came up with a really, really interesting uh, research report about that. And it, basically, what it would do is look at, take all the history of, of the results, and look at the, look at the diff, or look mm -hmm. at the changes you just made, and tell you what other, what are the tests that are most likely to break, and you run those first. And you say maybe I just want to run five percent of the most likely tests to break, something like that. I heard this story from Matt actually. And um, and if, if test tools can understand how to be given like a, a preference of what to do, yeah. And if this tool the tool exists, then I think I think that will be a really powerful way to do it. So that. it's just like this part of your system most likely to break, so I will test like it yeah. first, something so like that. So if if anyone um, if anyone wants to to read that report, um, just. Send me a message. Go send me. Uh, I don't know. I'll post it on the queue for me in this tomorrow. Uh, you can figure out where it is. Does, does it have free rerun option? Yeah, yeah, it does. So that's maybe an alternative. You tell B hat. Like if you've had a failure case, B hat's an option where it will run the failed tests first. So it's kind of more basic version of this kind of intelligence. Right. The test most likely to fail is the one that failed last time around. So if you run it with the rerun option, yeah. try the ones that failed last time. Mm. 
he, he's a thought. Back in a case. You, you can also run, uh, this is like a lever commit, you only run the tests that are related to the screen. And then once a day, run mm. all of them. Well, he, he's yeah, a thought. We do. Yeah, we maybe, do. maybe an idea that hasn't been implemented yet. <laughs> Another one. Another uh, one. Is it sixth? It's good to know what's coming. So, yeah, so uh, you, could, you could get the, the response. It should be a response from Carl, and okay, we have seen this response before, like create the blob of it, and everything is green if this is the response. There has been no change in the context file. Just mark it green and don't even test. So it saves some time, not a lot, but save. Overall, you can, you know, it's like an extension. Not much, actually, because the most of the time is spent doing making the request. Like, like an event-driven, like, uh, you know, event source. You get a blob of it, put it somewhere. But you still, make, you make you still have to make the yes, but you don't have the nobody. Uh, no, all those uh, JavaScript interactions with the page sometimes it takes time as well. Oh, that's what you need. So you can drive it because he's using Selenium. What do you want to drink? That's, that's <laughs> well, let's 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 just like uh, let's start drinking. <laughs> <laughs>